Okay, so let me, let's start. So let's take the, this next time we have to do next few hours or so, 40 minutes before the next break. I want to uh, show you some basic about molecular dynamics. And of course, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. I already have people asking me, how do I set this up or what? So that's exciting. Um, so let's see a little bit uh, what I would like you to um, pay attention to. So how to, how you start the simulation? So you have your uh, species. How do I start, okay? How do I analyze my results? And again, how do I link? How do I extract information? So I was showing you this, just a reminder, because one of the questions we were asking before is, I have my gas phase, now I want to grow. How do I, what do I consider? Look at this movie, first of all. The point, the reason why I want you to, to see this before we start into details is because things are moving, but things are moving um, relatively to each other, but also they are moving, so they are rotating, okay? So when you try to describe a system, you want to be as comprehensive as possible. So internal degree of freedom, the ability of a molecule to rotate, not only to translate and meet something, it's very important, okay? And energy, temperature all play a role in this uh, distribution of the things. Okay, so basic idea. Molecular dynamics is about solving Newton equations. What does that mean? So you have your molecules, you have your structures. Uh, so it, equation F equal um, MA. And so MD, so mimics uh, what the atoms do, basically the dynamics, how they move, assuming some kind of interactions. So you want to solve F equal MA. The mass, you know, because you can draw your molecules, right? You need information about the forces. So you need to know if a carbon atoms meets another carbon atoms, do they like each other? Do they attract each other? Do they repel each other? You need some information about the type of interaction that will give you the forces, basically. Once you have those two information, you can derive your acceleration. And so acceleration is basically velocity. So over time, how the things are moving. That's what you care about. So, Energy function usually is what the thing that you look for and is uh, a way to calculate the forces. So you will find something called potential um, in molecular dynamics and this is very important because potential is what is basically described interactions, okay? It's about F that you are looking for. And so Newton's law will tell you how they are moving, so the motion of those atoms. Just as a note, the first MD simulation was in 1957. And so you can imagine uh, that, uh, you know, with the evolution of computers, uh, how many, um, how much things have changed and what the power of this technique at this point. So what you do is to simulate the trajectories of atoms. So assuming that you have a, something simple at this point, let's assume that you have a nitrogen in a box and you want to know how fast the molecules are moving, for example, in a certain temperature, okay? So you have uh, spheres, nitrogen, so you, have, uh, you know the mass, you have a certain number of particles. So you need an algorithm at this point. You need an algorithm that helps you to predict um, how the position, the velocity, and the acceleration um, is a function of the time, okay? So what do you need to, sol to resolve this equation from a computational point of view, the component? So, you need to, um, let's do it. So if you have F equal MA, you can look at that as a U is the force field that I was mentioning. So is the potential energy that you have. And um, so the question is, if I'm solving F equal MA, what do you think I need uh, to solve uh, my uh, system at this point? So how do I start? Newton equation is to be integrated, right? So if I just put the masses in a box, molecules in the box, F equal MA is not going anywhere because it doesn't have information. What else do you need as input, do you think? You need the velocity. You need to know something about time zero, what's happening, okay? You need to know positions. You need to tell me that the atoms are, you know, what they are, and then you need the velocity also somehow. Velocity is related to the velocity, to the temperature also. So, slowly. Three things, you need the forces, so F we talked about, and then you need to know the positions, and you need to know the velocity initially. 
Okay? So you have to prepare your system. You need to tell me, I am at 300 Kelvin, I have nitrogen. How do I translate this into position and velocity of nitrogen? So the first thing that I want you to see is that you have a lot of molecules of nitrogen in your system, and so you have an N, those are coupled <coughs> equations that you want to solve, okay, for each of the particles that you're interested in. And so if you have N particles, we have three N positions of coordinates, and three N velocities, basically, that you have to do. And so, the analytical solution is impossible at this point. What you do is a numerical solution. That's where MD comes in, at this point. But if you look at Newton equation, you can write it this way, right? So this is, uh, um, again, MA, so the mass and then the acceleration is the second derivative of the, the position over time square, right? And so, the forces as a function of the distance of all the molecules. This is very important because it's telling you that the force depends only on the position of the system, okay? So if you're looking for a force that can describe this interaction, the distance is what you care about between the atoms in the system. So forces, that's the first question. So I had uh, um, someone coming over and said, you know, I don't do specifically my combustion, but I do more metals. So where do I get my forces? So um, the forces usually, they can come from very, very accurate simulations, and that's what they call uh, um, quantum mechanics, or ab initio MD. Uh, or you can choose them a little bit, uh, what they call make some approximation, and so you get a classical MD. So this is based on uh, um, basically the assumption that you do with the Schrodinger equation, and I don't want to go into details now, but the idea is that usually you have nuclei and you have electrons in your molecules. If you can decouple them, so Born-Oppenheimer approximation, you can go with the classical MD. That is what is the most used um, at this point, okay? There are very, um, there are other techniques that are very precise as a Benicio MD, but I'm not going to discuss those here. Those are for um, very expensive calculation when you're interested in something very specific for a short amount of time. And so um, the potential that you find those potential in the literature. So if you go in the literature, you can find the forces. So some people just spend their entire life to develop potential for those molecular dynamic simulations. We will see tomorrow something called REACTSFF for if you're interested in reaction. For today, no reaction. So we're just looking at the dimerization. So there is no bond, but there is only interaction that you, that you will see, Van der Waals interaction. So, um, depending on your system, you can have very simple Leonard Jones, we'll show you. Quantum mechanics is very complicated, but or you can have reactions, and that REACTSFF is one of the most used one. Or you can have classical MD, that is uh, what we use also for combustion, and is, uh, there are different force fields that you find. So if you look up, for example, CHARM as a force field, is able to describe the interaction between carbon and hydrogen in hydrocarbons. Okay? That's what you're looking for at this point. So ab initio molecular dynamics, again, um, those are very expensive um, calculations. And uh, unless you have a specific question that you are interested at this point, the time scale and the size is very, very uh, limited. So this is not what we are going to use for um, this study here. But I wanted you to just know that some people are doing ab initio molecular dynamics. Um, again, Born-Oppenheimer approximation, the motion of the atoms, nuclei, and the electrons can be separated. So we only look at the nuclei, we don't look at the electrons. Uh, and so if you want to look at the electrons also, you will have um, an ambition MD. Okay, so what we use is a classical, what they call classical molecular dynamics at this point. And uh, um, it works very well for simple particles, especially for double gases. It does not work if uh, um, for uh, covalent atoms, you know, if you want to, for example, do some reaction, uh, there are some approximation. So we'll talk about REACTSFF later, but they are very fast. So they are fast, they can deal with the big size of the system and relatively long time scale. So this is a good approximation for our systems. So when we talk about forces, what kind of forces do we include? Okay, so what does that mean? I have my um, pyrene and pyrene, what kind of forces they can have, how they can interact. So there are mainly, this is the list of all the forces that usually we include. 
Um, the first one, so first of all, remember that we talk about distance. If you integrate the Newton equation, you see that the forces are only depending on the distance. That's what I showed you before. So we have a Coulomb potential, so the charges. That's one type of interaction. If the two molecules have charges, there is Coulomb between them. Polarization, it's very complicated. So if you have um, a charges, you have a dipole on the molecules. Uh, usually, we don't include that because there is the, um, it's super complicated at this point. So unless you have a specific question, um, then you do a different technique. But I want you to, to see those, the, the complete list. And the other one is the attractive and the repulsion. Those are the four main interactions you can have. You know, if you think about di um, pyrene, pyrene. Now, the last two is usually um, they combine, so the attractive or repulsive, and this is called uh, Leonard Jones potential. Okay, it's something that you might have heard. So, um, Coulomb potential, polarization usually is neglected, and Leonard Jones potential. So, again, your goal is to take two pyrenes and describe the forces between them. So this is just a, um, an example of the Leonard Jones potential. What that means is that you have two molecules that is a certain distance, and so um, you have a, a, an attractive or repulsion part of the forces between them. Um, epsilon is the well depth, and this is the energy per bond. Sigma is proportional to the point where the force uh, disappear, basically. And so the way you write it is a phi here, that is the forces, the potential here, is a function of sigma and epsilon. But this describes once you have two molecules. So if the two molecules are far away, you're here. There is nothing between them. Eventually they get closer and closer, so the distance goes down, and you start going down in the well. So there is a minimum in which they really like to stay together. And then if they get too close, so the distance goes down, they would repel each other. Okay, so you start from them far away, then they get closer, the minimum, they are very nigh, happy here, and then if it's too close, they don't like each other. Okay, so I think you have this graph in the slide, this is exactly the same things in which you have a curve that usually is computed the way the molecular dynamics and show you, you know, how um, um, those are the type of interaction that you can have. So. You have this kind of uh, uh, Leonard Jones, for example, in the literature. What you need to do, you have to calculate the forces. And so the way he works here is that you need to take um, the derivative. So you have a potential that usually you find in the literature. So you have this uh, phi here that is a function of the distance only. And you take the derivative of this, and this will give you the forces. Okay? So remember, F equal ma, you start from a potential you get the forces with the derivative. So that's the first step. So you have uh, two molecules interacting, I and J, and there is uh, some distance between them, and this is just a cartoon of the type of uh, um, uh, system that you solve. Now, you have a lot of molecules in the system. So remember the gas, the, the lot of uh, spheres, if you want, in the system. And so what you need to do, the energy is the sum over the energy of all pairs of atoms in the system. So I have uh, um, interacting here, for example, Rij, so the distance between a particle I and J. So I'm going to say one with the three, one with the two, one with the, um, all the numbers that you can see here, that you can think about. So they need to, as a pairs, they need to interact with each other. Remember, your box is a lot of molecules, so it's a little bit more complicated. So you get this uh, potential, pairwise interaction, and then the total energy of the atoms is basically given by these equations. So you have the, pot the potential energy here, and you do the sum over all the molecules in the system, so one to n, and the reason why you have a one and a half is because you don't want to double count, okay, so um, reactions. So somehow you go to the literature, you find the potential, for your system. Be careful, if you want a metal, you have some potential. If you want an hydrocarbon, you choose something else. Once you have the, the potential, your uh, system is going to derive the forces. It's the first thing you need to do. The forces comes from the derivative of this potential, okay? The second thing is that you need to have some velocity. You need to know how initially they are moving the things, and that's function of the temperature. So something that you might have seen even in your classes, this is a Boltzmann distribution. 
So if you have a, a number of molecules, and this is the velocity basically, this is telling you that as a function of the temperature, you can have an average velocity that is going to change. Okay, and so Boltzmann derivation, uh, KBT, and the mass. So as a function of, this is the constant, Boltzmann constant, the temperature, and mass. And of course, um, you know, this is a lower temperature than 1,000, maybe in 2,000 Celsius. So how the velocity, the speed, changes with the temperature, okay? So that's something that you assign also to the atoms initially. And the last thing is that you really have to locate your molecule. So you need to have some coordinate in your atoms. So um, if usually you have a, a solid, is a crystal, you can see some structures that look like this. So they are very well ordered. If not, you have something that is more um, messy, and so you have a more a gas of a liquid. You know, they are not well-defined position, but they move a lot. So here is just a picture of an MD initial configuration. So I'm, um, I define my volume. So think about a flame. You kind of um, uh, run a simulation in a volume of the flame, okay? So I have my volume, and then I have uh, uh, a lot of molecules of, um, this is an example for you. So I have nitrogen. In this case, it's very dense, and you have um, all the spheres. In this. this is my initial picture. Now, I need to know, again, my potential because I need the forces. I need to know if I am a certain temperature, what is the Boltzmann distribution of those velocity? Of course, you have some position you locate down. So I have all my initial condition to run my simulations. So how do you do that? Those are the main step. So you set the particle position, first of all. That's what we did in the simulations. You assign some initial velocity based, for example, on Boltzmann distribution. Then you calculate the forces, okay? Step one, you have the um, Newton equation and you calculate the forces knowing the potential, of course. And then you start moving the particles by a delta T to get to the second point. You save, you now you have the molecules in a second position, you save this position and you keep going with the Newton equation integrating the system, okay? So, if you want to look at this kind of a graph, what you do, you set the positions, you assign some velocity, then you calculate the forces on each particle, move the particle to delta t, and delta t is a big deal. How far you move will give you a different answer. So you have to be careful about this, we'll talk about this. And then you save the position, the particle, so now you have a new initial condition for um, um, Newton equation. Then you save the result and eventually you keep going until you stop the simulations. Okay, so now how do you integrate Newton equation? And that's the first question. So you have this equation that we talked about. And so we um, divide the time into time steps, okay? So uh, usually, let's say that you wanna run for one microsecond, okay? That's your simulation. You wanna see on one microsecond, the two pyrene, what are they going to do? So you divide your time into small time steps, usually is a um, few femtoseconds, so 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And again, in each time step with delta t, you compute the forces, you move the atom, update the position, and you keep going, okay? To do that, you need to choose a way to integrate Newton equation. And so you choose your integrator. Here is an example. So I have, um, um, I have the position at time t zero. What I do, I move to the second step in which I add my delta t. And um, without giving you too many details, basically, what you come up is uh, this kind of expression. So this is the, called the Verlet algorithm, in which it tells you how to move to the next step. It's a way to choose the integration. You need to be careful about the integrator that you choose, but this is just one example. It's very widely used. And so your distance at Ri, so at time t plus delta dt, you have an expression that looks like this, okay? So you are integrating Newton equation using this type of integrator. So again, you have, you do uh, this computational, what they call a computational experiment. So you select the position and the velocity, you integrate, compute all the forces, you have a new position. At this point, 
the system, if you keep running, it reaches the equilibrium, maybe, and then you average the quantity that you're interested in, okay? So how do you do that? So static uh, the simulations. Um, there are three main things that practically you want to look at. So how to initialize the positions, how to equilibrate the system, and how to control the simulations. The position is exactly what I will show you. I'll show you a cartoon, but in general, they are defined on the lattice, if you're doing like a solid, or they are random. They can move in the box, right? The velocity you assign based on Boltzmann distribution also, and um, the initial state, it's not the equilibrium state. So this is very important. You start your simulation, the molecules need time to reach an equilibrium. So the first time of the simulation is just to reach the equilibrium. And then once you're there, you can look at your, you can run the real simulations, okay? So you need to reach an equilibrium in some of the properties that you're interested in before you can derive some information about the data that you're interested in properties. So how do you do that? How can you understand if you reach the equilibrium and now you can read the numbers, okay? So some, um, in MD, for example, if you um, are running, you remember initially we were talking about the system. I told you, you need to decide what you want to keep constant. So you have, one option is what they call NVE. So in my box, I want to say the volume does not change, the number of particles does not change, and the energy is conserved, okay, over time. Could be an ideal situation that you're interested in. If that is the case, then you can look at the temperature and the pressure in your system and see how um, they are behaving in your simulations. If, for example, instead you're running an MVT in which you keep the temperature constant, so think about the small volume in a flame in which you do know that the temperature is not changing much and the volume, you're not creating any new reaction, you increase the volume. Um, then what you can do is basically looking at the pressure or the energy in your system. So those are all the properties that can change. And if you are constrained, three in this case, you can check the other two, for example. When you run an MVT, now it's a little bit more complicated because how do you keep the temperature constant in your system? So the molecules are moving. How do you make sure that the temperature remains the same? If you remember velocity and temperature are related. And so what usually people do in a simulation is to add the thermostat. So what that means is an algorithm that add or removes energy according to the system. So think about that. The molecule is going too fast, right? The temperature is too high. You want to keep your temperature at 300 Kelvin, but the, temp the molecule is going too fast. You need something to dump energy. So the thermostat is taking energy away from the molecule so that it slows down and is back to the temperature that you want, okay? So that's a way, an algorithm, to remove the energy. So, um, again, too much, I don't wanna show you too much math, but the, the point here, and again, those slides are meant to give you a glimpse. If you are more interested, there is a lot that I can tell you about this. But all NPT, for example, in which you keep constant the temperature, um, they need the thermostat. So they need the, some way to remove when things go too fast or they go too slow because you want to keep a certain temperature. And so the momentum of the temperature is proportional to the kinetic energy here. And so that's a way to control the temperature here, you know, that, uh, of the system. So something that looks like this is a thermostat. So this is your system. Think about MVT. You want to run your molecule in MVT. Like the outside there is a, some kind of a bath, is a heat bath that keeps your system at the right temperature. That's what you're interested. So depending on the high temperature or low temperature, you will either remove or add uh, energy to the particles. If instead you're interesting, uh, interested in an MPT, that's your choice also depending again on the reactor that you're interested in, you want to simulate, then you need uh, uh, not only a thermostat, but you need something that controls the pressure too. So there are different algorithms in the system. And here I just want to um, tell you that um, those things need to be taken into account. So these are part of the initial input to the molecular dynamics. 
So the equilibration, after you set up your system, so you decide this is my position, this is my initial condition, and I want to run in MVT or MPT, whatever you like for your reactor, then the system likely is out of equilibrium. So you need, for example, the, the temperature can spike. You want to run your system at 300. The algorithm needs to bring you back to the condition that you're interested in. Okay, so there is an initial phase in which things just um, needs to find time to get an equilibrium. So that's a very important point. And so the property will not be stationary, so they will not give 300 Kelvin, but they will drift a lot in this case. And so you must wait for a number of steps to reach the equilibrium. What you do is basically looking at, um, this is just an expression for a general property. So you have an initial condition, there's something that you add over time that brings you to the, the, the value that you want. So say that you have an initial condition, you wanna run your simulation at 1000 Kelvin. Initially, your molecule will be either higher or lower. You need to wait until it reach 1000 Kelvin, and then you will start uh, the production run, basically. So the question is, how long do we wait? Okay, sometimes uh, you, know, you have the simulation. So the best solution that usually we do is to watch for an observable. So what that means is that if energy and number of particles and volume are fixed, check for the temperature. So in your system, you're running your trajectory. If you see that your temperature starts from 300, it is going up to 1500, but it doesn't come down to 1000, that's what you want, then there is a problem. So take uh, some of the uh, constraint that you have at the beginning and watch for the other two, temperature, pressure, or volume, depending on what you chose, okay? So what if I have a box that looks like this? So we're saying, again, you have a nitrogen. The only thing I wanna show you here, these are color-coded according to the position. So initially, um, you know, I just have some molecules blue here, green and red. This is my initial box. So molecular dynamics are run usually in a cubic box, and it's up to you to choose the size of this box. The bigger the box, the more consuming is the simulations. You choose the number of molecules that you want to put inside. You choose the position. You give an initial velocity. You run your simulation. Wait that you reach an equilibrium, and then you start computing what you're interested in. The simulation here is just meant to show you that what happened is that they start moving. So give a velocity, and you can see that there is a, some diffusion. So those molecules are blue. They start moving into the green region, but you have something that was red here that is coming back here. Do you see now they become red? So this is telling you that when you run your simulations, Usually you have a small volume, but reality is a bigger volume. So what we do is implement some boundary conditions to the system. Sometimes when you run the molecular dynamic, what you see visually, and it's just an artifact of the simulation, is that some of the molecules that are red here will move and you will see them coming back in this size, basically here. And this just means that um, you are um, somehow tricking the simulation to think that there is a bigger system, okay? Similar here, this is exactly the same thing. So, so I have my blue here, the green and the red, and slowly you see a different velocity also that they will somehow cross over uh, to the system in this case. Okay, no, I don't know why this is twice. This is another example. Now let's assume that you wanna see um, the fluid, some kind of fluid, uh, moving or sliding in a pipe, or um, we were interested once in uh, lubricant, okay? So you have your surface, basically, the first surface is not moving, and you have a bunch of atoms, up to you to define if they are very packed or not, depending on the system. What you're seeing here is that they move over time. So if you're interested in knowing how fast they go, what kind of configuration they get at the end, how fast they diffuse, this is a good way to do that, okay? And again, you give some initial position, you wait over time, and they will move according to the potential also that you have in the system. Um, I don't know why I have this one. Okay, 
So let's assume now that you run your simulation, you found your equilibrium, you know how to set it up. What kind of data can you get? Okay, yes, you can make a movie like this, and that's nice. A movie is usually a trajectory over time, it takes a little bit of time, but it shows you visually what's happening to the system. Now, I listed those as the main thing. So you have trajectory data. Question is, you can get some fundamental quantity. So you can get the total energy, the temperature, the pressure, the volume from the trajectories. That's easy. But you can get also some structural quantity. So can I get information about how the molecules are arranging themselves right now? For example, um, you can do an analysis of the conformation. You can do something about a phase change. So I start with something that is very compact. I can end up with something that is very um, low density. So you can have a phase change in which you start from like solid, the liquid, and you become gas. And then you have also um, free energy calculation. You can get the transport coefficient. So you want to see how fast this molecule is moving. This is other com uh, quantity, so diffusion coefficient. Something is straightforward, temperature, pressure, volume. Something are called structural quantity, other are dynamic quantity. So some of those is uh, diffusion, but also free energy calculations. Okay? So this is the type of information you can get. So this is an example of the problem. Now I have a trajectory. You want to know the temperature. Okay, so let's assume that you run, I don't know, NVE, so volume uh, energy, something. Now you want to check what happened to the temperature in your system. You go the trajectory and you see that over time, your temperature looks like this. Okay, sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, and then you can do this for multiple trajectories also. Now, how you calculate the macroscopic property from this type of information is a little bit of a, a challenge. You need a distribution, you need to run for a long time and enough simulations to give an answer to that. And so here comes two slides of a little bit of math um, because this is an important point. So I want to talk about ergodicity. Um, it's it's um, something that uh, uh, sometimes has been missing in some of the results that I have seen. And so uh, let's talk for a second about this. Um, first, maybe let's go with this first, the ergodic hypothesis. That's very important. So in MD, the idea is that why we can replace a simulation over time with an answer in the macroscopic world, okay? And so this is called um, ergodic hypothesis and is driving all these MD simulations. So in MD, you want to replace a full sampling um, by a very long trajectory. Okay, this is okay if the system is ergodic. And so the ensemble average, so what you're doing here, you're taking a property, okay? And you're saying that the ensemble, the average of this property over the ensemble is equal to the average of the property over time. So that makes you, allow you to make a jump between one trajectory that you have in MD with the property of the ensemble. Okay, so this is one important point for in, the, in, the, in the system. And so, um, if you go back to the temperature, sorry, we should go maybe to this. So usually a property according to MD simulations here and statistical mechanics is defined in this way. So you have the property, you have the density of the state of this property, so there's a lot of statistics. And so the probability density distribution, so this is a raw that you're interested here in solving this integral is basically, is function of, uh, this is the expression that you have usually, and it's function of a Q. A Q is basically a partition function in the system. So from the MD simulations, you have the Hamiltonian, you have a Q, from Q you can get the density of the states here, and once you have raw, you put it back here and you get your A basically, okay? So you need to have some information about the raw, the density, and that's what uh, somehow MD is giving you. And so if I do this for my temperature, remember that you want a number for the temperature, you look at this. So MD is going to tell you velocity, you have the masses, and you need to get some information about raw from the simulations. Once you have this, you solve this integral here, and you can get your number T, 
So this is an equation that shows you how you link the microscopic property of an MD to basically a more macroscopic property of the system. So, um, and this uh, MD will do for you somehow. You can just post-processing your data to get the temperature that you want. But the point is that you need to be in ergodic hypothesis. So you are basically replacing a long trajectories with the number that you want in the ensemble of the molecules, okay? So, let's see some of the properties. So, assuming that you know how to run this simulation, you have some ideas now, look at the macro scale. This is an example of the water, okay? So, you have water, you have an iceberg, you have a glacier, you have liquid water. Microscopically, that's what I see. What you see in your simulations, uh, of course, is something that doesn't look like that, but you have to, it looks more like this. So if I have a solid state, my molecules will look like this. What you see is a regular spacing between them, right? If you have a liquid, you start seeing a little bit of uh, chaos, if you want, it is not well defined, so it's a regular spacing. And then if you have uh, gas, you will have a lower density, and this is the type of system. Okay, so macroscopically, we talk about gas, solid, liquid. From anatomistic simulations, I'm looking at the molecule and I'm looking at space, at density in my volume, okay? And so during the simulation, for example, you can have that you have this liquid in this situation, the molecules are starting like this, and by the end of the simulations, you have a phase transition and you form some gas, basically, in the system. The density is much lower than that. And so um, the idea is that can we measure the distance, for example, of the particles in this case? Because that's the way to assess what kind of phase you have, right? And so briefly, I want to mention about what they call radial distribution function. That's another property of molecular dynamics. So molecular dynamics is just giving you a trajectory. You're not done. You need to find a way to translate the trajectory into properties that you're interested. And so one thing that uh, it's useful, especially when you talk about the structures also, is what they call radial distribution function. And so it's the ratio of the density of atoms and the distance r by overall uh, the density. So it's the relative density of atoms as a function of the radius. So assuming that you are here, for example, you want to know how many particles are here this way. So think about the gas or the liquid. If you have a solid or a liquid, you will find them closer and more regular spacing than if you have gas, they're far away. And so this is something else that you can compute uh, with the molecular dynamics. It's called G of R, and basically it's the local density, and this is the overall density of the system. So another property that you can get from an MD. So even if I show you a picture of the uh, water, of a glacier of an iceberg, for me, for molecular dynamics, it looks like this. So I take my hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, so molecules, and here I have uh, uh, my molecules, so oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen, and I put them in a box, okay? And so um, I run my simulation at different temperature, and then I have trajectories. You can see here that some of those, so the forces are defining the type of interactions. One thing that water likes to do is hydrogen bonding, right? And so if you have an hydrogen in these molecules, if you are in some specific condition, it will bind uh, to a hydrogen of the other molecule. Not a real binding, but it's an hydrogen bonding, so it's, a, it's very weak. But, you know, for us in MD, the box will look like that. It's just a volume with a bunch of molecules inside. Now, I run my trajectories, I compute the radial distribution function, what I just showed you, mathematics GNR. And what you get is a something that looks like this. What does that mean? So, if you look at the, um, the one on the, on, uh, on the top, this is basically telling you the distance of an oxygen from another oxygen, okay? And so, um, the hydrogen bonding, so you see that there is a preferred peak here that is 2.8, and this is basically the hydrogen bonding between the system. If you do the bottom one, is the hydrogen-oxygen distance. So if I look on average, if I have my hydrogen and oxygen here, you have one angstrom. That's the majority, the binding of the hydrogen in the molecules. 
And then you have other peaks because you have the neighbors of uh, the, depending on the um, structures and the peaks, you can find um, a defined peak, meaning more like a solid, or you can find like a liquid that is more dispersed. So the question is here, let's assume that independently of the system right now, I get something like this, or I get something like this. What you can tell me from this graph, if it's a solid or a liquid. And the reason, the way you do that, again, is with the regional distribution. Here, you have a solid. You can see that the peaks are very well defined. So you have just a, a peak here, a peak here, you have some atoms here in those four, um, three distances here. When you have a liquid, you have something that looks like this. Okay? So you don't know if you have a phase change looking just at the snapshot, but what you can infer is that computing those properties, you have some information about how things have evolved over time. So initially you can start, for example, like this with the solid, and then you run over time, maybe you have a temperature changing, you can end up with a system like this. And so what you can tell me from this structural property is that I went from a solid to a liquid change, okay? So again, this is properties going from the trajectory all the way to the, um, of an MD to some bigger uh, macroscopic property, so phase change. Okay, a couple of comments about this. I want to show you a problem that I have seen in the literature. First of all, the integrator. We talked about the Verlet algorithm briefly before. Um, small error or minimal difference in the initial condition can lead to different trajectories. So you need to be ergodic in your system. You have to be careful about the time, the simulation. You make sure that you equilibrate your system also. Um, you need to make sure that the simulation is long enough, basically. That's what you need. Conservation of energy is very important. So when you start the simulation, usually the first thing I ask my students if they do an MBT is that is the energy conserved in your system. Okay, um, that's, we can allow errors in the simulations and usually you have a 001 KT, depending on the temperature. The other consideration is that the CPU of your simulation, so someone asking, can I run on my laptop? The CPU is completely dominated by the calculation of the forces. And so when you choose the integrator, how to, in the algorithm that requires a few evaluation of the forces is usually preferred. So there are a few tricks that you play um, also with the integrator in the system. And the other thing that is very, very important is the time step. Um, energy should be conserved of the system. And so I want to show you an example in which this has been a huge problem. So the choice of the time step has to be small enough to conserve energy, but you don't want too small that the computer is going to die to run the simulations. And so usually, we time step of one femtosecond is something that um, is used in our simulations, but really depends on the systems. And again, if you remember, there are two parts. There is one that is the equilibration. Your system reach to, needs to reach the condition that you're interested in. And then there is the production run in which you record the data that you're interested in. Now, um, the example that I have here is uh, um, something that looks like this. And I, let me explain this in a, in a second. So I took different potentials, okay? I was interested in a system actually that looked like this. I'm not going to show you anything here, but I mean, in a moment. So. I had some uh, um, uh, SI4, so silicon in the system. So let's say right now I have five atoms. I had a cluster of four and I had one, okay, coming in. So the one was going to collide with my cluster. My question, the first question is what kind of potential do I look? Remember, the first thing is beside the velocity and uh, position, you need to know something about, you have to find the force field. You need to find what is a good force field and what is the delta T. The Verlet algorithm, the integrator, needs a delta T to move. So here is uh, some of the analysis that we did with the potential. And what I want you to see, first look at the uh, cluster. So the result with different potential with the cluster, what you see is that the cluster 
so whether it's the blue, the green, um, basically they are all on the same line, okay? This is telling you that the cluster, if I choose a time step of either 0, 01 or 0, 025, I'm good. I can conserve my energy. If I use the same time step for the collision, now, this is going to be is a, is a big problem. So the zero point, you look at the red, now I have a collision. I have a cluster and I have a collision, something coming in with a time step that even, even smaller, so 0 0.01 femtosecond, so smaller, this should be better than the blue one, for example. Right? Look at what happened, my energy. It's completely, it's, not cons it's, it's a mess, basically. So the total energy variation, um, it's not what it's supposed to be. So this is a showing you that the choice of time step, it's very important. You cannot just take any time step and run your simulations. If a time step works for a cluster, so looking at four things together, when you have a velocity, things are completely different. And so a sensitivity or make sure that your time step is the right one to conserve energy, it's very important. Now, this movie shows you, I don't remember when one I have first. This is a simulation in which we had uh, um, a certain time step. So what you saw was the collision coming in, this guy colliding with the cluster of four and basically uh, falling apart. The second one is the same type of simulations with uh, a different solution, basically of the system. It should be the difference, hopefully. Did, did it look different to you? No? I don't remember. Sorry. One of the two is different. One second, let me see. Good one. I don't know what's happening to this. I'm seriously, I don't know what I, to my computer. Anyway, so what you see here, that I don't know why this is weird, right? but in the first one, I used the wrong time step. I used the time step that was not conserving the energy, the red one. And what you see is that the four clusters, one coming in, they basically crash into each other and they fall apart. Okay, the second one, I used a time step that was conserving energy and what you are supposed to see is that the four cluster and one coming in, basically they bounce into each other, the cluster is preserved and one atom is going away. So the point is, if you're not careful with the delta T, if you're not careful in conserving the energy, the answer that you give is completely wrong or completely different. And so, just running an MD simulation with a time step that you've seen in the literature is not the right answer here, okay? So the important and the ability of a force field to conserve energy is paramount. So you need to check into those things. So this is an example of what's happening. Uh, this is, I was looking just at the, at the temperature, okay? So with the wrong time step, with not conserving the energy. Look at what happened here. I have a time step that is really not good for my collision. I start this. This is when the, uh, the one atom is bouncing into the cluster. At that point, you have a velocity, you have an impact, the temperature changes, the, um, the velocity and the temperature goes up. And then you go from this temperature all the way to 4,000, and then you try to go, like the huge spikes between 4,000 and 1,000 Kelvin. That, don't make much sense, okay? So the point is that molecular dynamic, I think is fun. You can do a lot of things, but not using as a black box. So you need to be careful about the things that you choose. Look at the potential. What is good for your system? That's the first question. Integrator, you need to solve Newton equation, how you choose your delta T. The delta T is function of, does it conserve energy, for example, okay? It's one of the questions that you want to answer. If you don't pay attention, the type of result that you get, they don't make sense sometimes, or they, are, they change with the condition that you're using that. Um, position and velocity initially, and then basically you um, advance the system with the Newton equation, you save, and you keep going like this to the system. So I want to talk briefly about the limitation of MD and show you finally some application for molecular dynamics and for the combustion. Um, for 
10, I'm supposed to give you guys a break. So um, just a little break, and then we can finish a little bit. Yes? I'm just uh, asking from uh, Please. a mathematical point of view and thermal fluid point of view. Almost you did is just the Lagrangian or Lagrangian analysis, right? Mm -hmm. You need the position and you need velocity. No, You're correct. I'm not, now I'm just uh, asking about the time. The time. Uh, yeah, because for the time you have shown uh, second order differential equation. Yeah. I mean, bearish of, uh, bearish of for, for two. So we have to have two uh, boundary conditions regarding the time. The second position, you have different positions, right? Mm -hmm. And force is direction of mass. So you have to have, in addition to the time discretization, we have to have a, a special discretization, right? So we have to have boundary condition. Even you, you, you have shown this in the slides. So we have to have initial I mean, time, boundary condition, uh, time conditions, and boundary conditions. So the first question, what is the second uh, time condition? And the second question is, what are uh, the boundary conditions that you uh, are using for yourself? Okay. So we can talk, I can tell you a little bit about the molecular data. So I'm going to give you guys the, uh, the break that I'm supposed to, and you and I can talk for a second about this, the reaction.